Good morning, everyone. I think we'll get started in just a few minutes. Um, as we're getting settled, please take some time to answer the poll question to help us better understand where each of your organizations are in your educational equity journey. Um, this will really help us ground the discussion today. We'll give folks just a few minutes to pop on and we'll start in a moment or two. All right, I think we just had a spike in, in a, a sign on. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us. I'm very excited to kick off our fourth installment of our Infinite Insights series. We are very grateful to have all of you joining us and diving into today's important discussion around addressing educational equity and, and really specifically the role data plays in this work. Um, we're also grateful to have all of you joining us. We acknowledge that this is a stressful time, um, a year unlike any other, and what feels like kind of an endless scenario planning toward targets that are really constantly in motion. So again, thank you for taking the time to be here with us. We have a really broad audience today of data leaders all across the country. Um, some are customer, customers of Hunuits that are leveraging our data analytics platform. Um, and we have many newcomers. So we extend a warm welcome to the Hunuit community. Um, we are really confident that you're gonna leave here today with inspiration and some really practical ideas for data use in your equity journey. Um, so speaking of equity journey, let's take a look at our poll results. Hopefully you've all had a chance to um, complete uh, the, the poll question as you were logging in. I don't know if you want to, Nicole, broadcast. Awesome. So we have, as I mentioned, kind of a broad set of, of organizations, and it looks like our, um, our poll results are sort of all across the board. Many of you are, are feel you're just getting started in, in your equity work. Um, a couple of you are experimenting with, with planning, and we do have 19% that are really feeling like you're embedding um, equity in everything you're doing. So that's amazing. We definitely want you to join in and share some of the milestones that, that help you get to that point. Um, so thank you so much for, for completing the poll. This will really help ground today's discussion. Um, so my name is Andrea Gromberg. I lead marketing and communications here at Who Knew It um, and will be your host for today's event. Um, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. We encourage you to ask questions and really share ideas um, and examples throughout today's discussion using the Q&A feature. We do have um, quite a few, I think there were about 250 registrants. Um, so we are in webinar only mode, but, but definitely want this to be interactive. So feel free to ask specific questions. We'll answer as many live as we possibly can. Um, and we'll also be recording this and, and um, making a, a Q&A document available after the fact. We we'll definitely want to get to, to all of the questions. Um, so let's dive in and meet our four presenters today. Um, I'll probably have you guys just give a wave as I call your name. So um, first we have Sarah Singer, our fantastic head of customer success. Um, so Sarah has worked with dozens of education organizations across the country. Um, from state departments down to small uh, suburban and, and rural districts, um, and has actually spent several years at Portland Public Schools um, leading systems planning, research, and evaluation um, that were all really deeply rooted in, in equity work. Um, so Sarah actually leads our customer success team here at Who Knew It, um, and her team of data advisors really help 
our partner agencies define and execute their data strategies. So um, she'll be leading much of the, of the discussion today. Um, we also have Dr. Courtney Stevens. Courtney, if you wanna give a little wave, our VP of Education Research. Um, Dr. Stevens has a very rich history of educational experience as well, starting in the classroom with, I, I feel like every role you could possibly have in a district, Courtney's led it. Um, and most recently served as Director of Accountability and Innovation and Education Technology at Washington Elementary School District right outside of Phoenix, um, where she actually implemented and led the usage of the Who Knew It tool. Um, we're now super lucky to have her on the Who Knew It side where she um, takes that practical education experience and continues to improve our platform um, and really help educators leverage data in the most powerful way possible. Um, also joining us is Tracy McCown, our senior solutions architect. Um, so Tracy's role at Who Knew It is really to help our partners um, pre-implementation, really scope and make sure their goals and initiatives are aligned to um, the, the platform and, and their strategic needs. So Tracy's actually gonna serve as our kind of product expert today as she does every day. Um, and if we have some time, we're actually going to jump in and show you some of these examples live and how they, they um, play out in the platform itself. Um, and Tracy will also be available to answer questions along the way. And then lastly, very excited to um, introduce our special guest joining us today, um, Marcy Locke. Marcy, if you want to give a wave? Um, Marcy is a passionate educator and, and data leader. Um, who actually stood up one of the first education data warehouses with her outstanding work at San Jose Unified District in California, gosh, decades ago, um, and has countless experiences of equity work. Um, I was teasing the team. Um, we probably have built, prepping for this webinar, um, probably five hours of content, just example after example. So we hope we, we um, brought surface the most re, uh, uh, um, meaningful ones today. Um, so uh, Mar Marcy has um, also founded the Silicon Valley uh, Regional Data Trust and its mission to change the culture and practice of how data is responsibly and ethically used to develop actionable solutions to critical education, health, and social problems. Um, and most recently served as Director of Data Governance and later Senior Advisor of Data Initiatives for the Santa Clara County Office of Education where she and her team oversaw the data zone solution, um, which is a data warehouse and visualization solution that's actually powered by the Who Knew It platform that Marcy and her team brought from just a few districts in 2016 to now dozens across six counties in California and continues to grow. Um, so thank you so much to Marcy for being here and, and sharing your experiences with us. All right, without further ado, I'm going to pass the presentation over to Sarah to really set the stage for today's discussion. Great, thanks, Andrea. All right, so um, as Andrea said, the goal for the next few minutes here is to set the stage for this, this conversation today. And I'm gonna start out by painting a picture of our current context. I think it's always important to assess your current context before diving in, in any type of analysis uh, or making recommendations or decisions or, or really discussing any type of meaty topics like this. And um, so the way, the way I see this right now is that there's three, what I'm gonna call momentous forces at play in our country right now. Um, they are so momentous that they, I believe are impacting everything, including uh, the K-12 space. Um, and they are so significant that this is a moment in time where I believe that our children's children are gonna be reading about this time right now in, the, in history books. Um, and so I don't think these momentous forces are gonna be a surprise to anybody here, um, but I still think it's important to talk about them. The first is obviously COVID-19. You all are courageously managing um, school districts and organizations through a pandemic. Um, this pandemic has forced the K-12 space, this is an industry not known for its innovation, um, to implement and, and, and upend entire uh, K-12 instructional delivery models in a matter of months. Um, and anytime we have change like this, we always have to ask ourselves, who is, who is who's being impacted by this change? 
um, who's being disproportionately impacted by this change. A second key momentous force is the economic under uncertainty, which is underlying the moment. Many of our students um, and their families are faced with unemployment, um, food security issues, housing security issues. Um, and then your organizations themselves may not know what your budget situation is. What is your, you know, you may be facing cuts or at the very least it's very uncertain for you, which makes it hard to plan. And then the third piece here is racial injustice. And, and I wanna be really clear about this particular point. Racial injustice didn't just suddenly emerge. Um, it was present prior to this moment. I think the difference right now is that there's been a ground swelling of, of national interest in this topic. Um, we as a nation, I think, are having conversations in more authentic ways, in more frequent way, and more frequently um, across a wider swath of, of people. Um, for those who tuned into the debates last night, it was a topic there. Um, it's, a, it's a conversation at the forefront of this nation's um, consciousness, I guess. And, um, and, and we know that this, this type of conversation can be tough, it can be taxing, it can be emotional. I think that's especially the case for, for folks of color. And um, so I just wanted to call that out. And, and, but I also wanna point out that I think times are tough right now. I think we can all acknowledge that. But I also believe that in moments like, like these, there are, um, there's still hope. And um, I think there's always opportunity in times of crisis. And, um, and that there can be, um, during this time, uh, a kind of opportunities or catalysts for positive change. And I think that's especially the case in the K-12 space. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about an example of something that I see that's positive. Um, so like I said, there's been a lot of attention paid to equity issues in the national media. Um, this means there's more, there's more light shed on these issues, which means there's more time, energy, resources, people paying attention to these issues. And one of those issues is the digital divide. Um, I have not seen this kind of movement. This is unprecedented movement, I believe, in addressing this issue. Um, and so if we think about post-pandemic world, I think we would be significantly further along in addressing the digital divide than we were before. That's just one example of, of some, a positive development um, during this time. And so I guess my, my hope is that as you listen to us speak today, is that you, you can think about what is possible. Um, what, like how can you make a difference in your own districts, in your own organizations to serve kids more equitably. Um, my hope is that it can be a just even a tidbit, anything that can help. Um, and that is our goal today. So um, just to kind of sum up this point, I've always believed that uh, everybody has a role in making a more equitable society. And I think a whole bunch of people doing a little bit of something around equity is really gonna move the dial. And so I hope today uh, gives you at least an idea of something that you personally can do in your own organizations. <clears throat> okay, so I think it's also important to define equity. Um, we at Who Knew It use the National Equity Project's definition. Uh, educational equity means that each child receives what they need to develop to their full academic and social potential. So that's the definition that we're going to use that's um, throughout kind of this presentation. Uh, I want you to kind of notice what this is and what this isn't. Um, what, what we're basically saying here is that not every, like different kids need different supports, different kids need different strategies. Um, equity in essence is not about equal inputs, it's about equal outcomes. And in this conversation, we are defining the outcome to be students reaching their full academic and social potential. And so, um, and so with that, I'm gonna hand this over um, to, to Courtney, Dr. Courtney Stevens, who's gonna talk a little bit about um, uh, who knew its role in, um, in, in this context. Awesome, thanks, Sarah. So as Sarah um, kind of brought us together to, to really think through kind of those major pieces that you guys are living through every day right now, what we wanna talk a little bit about today is the role that data plays in these conversations. As we've mentioned, you know, there's a ton going on all of these uh, changing dynamic forces that are all colliding in the school system right now. As Sarah mentioned, we really, um, really believe that every person plays a role um, in working through 
and having access to the right information to help districts move forward as they work with data. Um, our role as a platform, again, is to work with systems to really pull together all of those different discrepant areas that we currently carry data about students, about systems, about staff, about finance, and really bring them all into one place so that the ability to actually use data to make decisions is quick and easy. And that time can then be spent in actually implementing, researching, uh, really digging into rather than gathering, right? So we have time back to be actionable. The other major important piece that we play um, as the Who Knew It partner with the technology is really making sure that we are giving the right access and really making sure that security and privacy are, are foremost when we're working with data. Because we are collecting all of that information into one space, really making sure that the right people have access. Um, we have a ton of, of experience, um, a ton of passion around this topic as we know uh, data privacy um, is a major concern, both at the adult level, but also as we look to pull together data around schools. So today we're gonna to be talking a little bit more about kind of the role that the HNUA platform has played both um, from a product standpoint, but also an actual use cases on how we've had partners use the HNUA platform to really surface inequities and to really just kind of shine light on areas of disproportionality in areas of improvement around engagement, around decision-making, um, and really kind of talk about how the role data has played um, across our platform, across our partners um, around the nation. One of the things that you'll notice um, as we hear through the different ways we've seen data being used to successfully tackle some of these questions around inequity um, is that we are really, really grounded in answering questions. Right? So not just taking a look at data for the sake of data, um, but really as data's surfaced, digging into using those initial thoughts to really use the platform to investigate further um, and really digging into understanding the foundation of some of those inequities in your data kind of before we jump into the next plan of action. Right? So really using data responsibly um, as we talk through the platform really, again, making sure that we're grounding that use of data in questions. So we know that there's a wide variety of ways that different systems uh, use that, use data as part of their uh, school improvement process, as part of their root cause analysis. So I'm gonna actually kind of toss this over to Marcy to talk a little bit about um, some of the work that she's been a part of in um, taking just the, those stories about our kids and data inside the platform and really using them to kickstart really effective processes of change. Let me get myself unmuted. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, so the, the whole focus around equity has really been just a, a long held passion of mine. I always said at the beginning of my work with districts and, and data that behind every data element is a child. Um, and so when we're really talking about how do we improve our systems to help all kids be successful? Um, these kinds of frameworks that you're seeing on the slide, the Edward Deming's Plan Do, Study, Act cycle, um, Paul Pruce's root cause analysis work, Vicki Bernhardt's um, you know, framework around continuous school improvement with data uh, are all just near and dear to my heart. Uh, because I think unless we're really being thoughtful and systemic in how we look at our systems as a whole, um, we tend to jump to solutions without really having done the right kinds of root cause analysis uh, to really determine what's at the heart of, of uh, the inequities that we may see through our data. Um, so whether you're looking at um, current, you know, just in time data, what's happening right now. Um, you're also able to look at that long-term longitudinal view of how kids are faring in the system. And I, I think it, it really gets to the point that if you, um, if you want to um, really understand the root causes of inequities in the system, you have to be able to see the, how the system's policies and practices 
are leading to those outcomes. And that's where you have the power to really you know, institute significant change. Um, and I've seen over time, many, many districts tackle this work at a very deep, thoughtful level from equalizing um, disciplinary actions for students um, and, and the ways in which discipline is assigned to different students or looking at things like DNF lists and beginning to understand the root causes of those issues for, for students and to be able to start implementing action plans and then to be able to go back through these uh, continu continuous improvement cycles and really refine how those policies are being enacted in a district. So if you haven't already adopted something like this, I think it really becomes imperative that you do so uh, because again, we just don't want the kind of the quick solution or what appears to be a quick solution. We wanna really be thoughtful about how we implement change in, in a large um, education system. And Sarah, I think I was going to hand things off to you to really dig into more of these specific insights. Great, thank you, Angela. Um, so I wanted to start about, um, kind of talk a little bit about my role at Who Knew It. Um, actually, probably, uh, I may think I had the most awesome job in the world. And one of the reasons is that I get to work with over 300, who we, who we call customers, but, or partners, um, I should say, and, and our partners include districts, and those are you know rural districts, suburban districts, uh, urban districts, big, small, uh, heterogeneous districts, uh, homogeneous districts. We also work with state education agencies. Uh, we work with nonprofit organizations, and, and it's from all around the country. And so the really cool thing about my job is I get to observe your awesome practice, to be frank, and I get to learn from it. And so I have this really interesting um, kind of broad view and as does who knew it as a whole. Um, and we have this, uh, um, I think, uh, opportunity in some ways to share, and I'd almost say responsibility to share back some of what we see. Um, because some of the practices that, that you have been employing have been in my eyes, incredibly um, impressive and, and sometimes I would even say courageous. So what I, what I wanna talk about today is some of our observations um, uh, around actually your practice and specifically what we see successful organizations doing um, as, as they seek to create what I would call an equity focused data culture. So that's, um, that's what we're gonna do today. The other thing I just wanted to talk about is I'm gonna draw a little bit from my own personal background pre who knew it. I was at Portland Public Schools for almost a decade. The priority of our, our then superintendent was equity. That was the priority. And it was the priority for, for my entire duration there of nine years. So I am going to talk a little bit about um, some on the ground um, kind of lessons learned that I had while in that position as well. Awesome, Sarah. I just wanted to give a, a, a little plug. We've had a couple of um, chats in and out. Um, we welcome you to ask questions, make comments on any of the content that we're sharing today. Or if you want to raise your hand and share an idea, um, we welcome all of those and we'll, we'll work those into the discussion as we go. Thanks, Andrea. All right, so um, I'm gonna talk about what I'd call five characteristics of, of what we see um, in, in organizations who are um, cre creating equity focused data cultures. Um, the first observation, it's maybe obvious, but they prioritize equity <laughs> across the organization. And they understand that in that process, data is a necessary tool when leading with equity. They also understand it's not a, it's it's necessary, but not sufficient. You still need the right mindset. You still need a bunch of other things, but you definitely need data as as you lead with equity. Um, the second uh, observation is they make data widely accessible, and they disaggregate that data. Um, sometimes I've seen some organizations want to hide high data, like they don't want to be transparent with it because it's bad news. Um, the, data, the organizations that, that really do well in creating a, a data culture um, don't do that. They make it accessible. Um, the third 
is that they use relevant data, um, the data that that uh, and, and this means holistic data sets. So what we know about our kids, kids aren't one dimensional. Our data, it shouldn't be one dimensional either. Um, number four, we focus on efforts. They focus on efforts to increase usage and adoption of, of data, and they do so organization wide. Um, they understand that, that usage and adoption isn't just going to happen by itself, um, that you need an intentional effort uh, to, to increase usage and adoption. And fifth, they act on the data and they monitor progress along the way. So how many of you have been in meetings where there, you know, I think there's problem identifiers. There's, oh, we have a gap between this group and this group and everyone talks about the gap and then no one does anything. Um, and so we've, I think we've been in those meetings and the successful organizations, they are courageous enough to act. They understand and they monitor their progress along the way. And if they fail, they fail fast and they move on to another hypothesis on what, on what to do um, to intervene. And then they monitor progress along the way um, and go forth in that regard. So what I'm gonna do now is talk about um, organizations uh, and customers that I've seen who've um, embodied these characteristics. And maybe before we go on to examples, I just wanted to share, I believe Ron Road from San Diego Unified um, suggested a number six, which is the budget reflects equity focus, which I think is, is huge. And we actually have an example of that later on. It's great. Thank you. Right on. I completely agree. Thank you for that point. All right. So um, I'm going to talk about different different ways I've seen organizations prioritize equity uh, across the um, across their organizations, and um, I'm going to call out here uh, Howard County Public School System. They're a district in Maryland. They have um, a strategic plan. Many of you have a strategic plan, and one one way to prioritize equity is to to make sure that equity shows up in your strategic plan. So literally, Howard County's strategic plan is called learning and leading with equity. Um, similarly, you want to look at your organizational structures. Is, is, do you see equity living within your organizational structures? And for example, with Howard County, they have a director of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so what I would say is I'm noticing that that, that type of position, chief equity officer, those kinds of things, they are showing up all across the country, um, many organizations are beginning to recognize that that type of position is important. Now, what I would say is what's also really critical about that though, is that equity doesn't just live within that position. It has to be embedded throughout the organization. I think these types of positions um, play a fundamental role in building the infrastructure, um, helping to with, with professional development organizationally wide to ensure that equity is embedded um, across the organization. All right, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about some other um, tools I've seen um, as it relates to prioritizing equity. So one thing I talked about was that it's really critical to embed equity across the organization. And that looks like um, embedding equity, um, an equity lens in, in decision-making processes. So I'm gonna call out two districts here. Um, one is the North Clackamas School District. And that one is in uh, Oregon, it's about, uh, it, it's a district of about 40% free and reduced lunch, 40% uh, students of color. And in full disclosure, it's also the district that my second grade daughter attends. Um, and I've been watching them closely and have been impressed. So they, they use something called an equity lens. Um, and many districts in Oregon, by the way, use this type of tool. And it's a tool that you, um, you use prior to making large decisions that could impact students. So for example, um, like let's take a, a scenario where you are about ready to maybe make a recommendation to change a boundary. Um, a committee might look at the, this tool and they say, okay, does this decision align with the district's mission and vision? That's what North Clackamas folks might ask. Does, what systems of oppression might exist within this situation? Um, you know, who does the uh, decision affect both positively and negatively? Negatively, Are there unintended consequences for specific student groups? Those are the kind of questions they're asking. This is just a protocol that I think successful districts use um, when making key decisions. And so uh, I'll tell you with North Clackamas, the reason I'm calling them out, they're not a Hunuit customer. Um, in fact, I haven't actually even 
told them how impressed I am. I'm realizing I'm telling you all before I tell them, which is silly. Um, but I think like one example of them, I think using the equity lens is every single kid in, um, in the district who's on free and reduced lunch is literally hand delivered a meal daily if they're on free and reduced lunch and they opt into that program. The bus driver is the ones who do it. Um, so yeah, um, to, to Ron's point from San Diego, that did probably take, that, that probably cost some money, but they prioritized equity. And that is a, a, an example of, um, of an organization who I think prioritized equity. Um, the racial equity lens tool here at Portland Public Schools, this is literally um, a bookmark. It's sitting on my desk right now. I just took a, a photo of it using my iPhone here. And, and this was something that we used when I was there. Uh, these bookmarks uh, were handed out at orientation and onboarding. They were made into posters. Um, every, every PPS employee had one um, and it was uh, absolutely ubiquitous in our culture. All right. All right, here's another example of an organization prioritizing equity. And this is the, the school district U46 and they're in Illinois. So one of the things about prioritizing equity is it's really important that you don't let people forget about it. You gotta keep it in the forefront of uh, the consciousness of the organization. And so what I like about this particular example um, is that U46, which was last spring, they, they were like many of you all probably worried about attendance participation in e-learning. And so they, they made a metric at the time called e-learning attendance. They were worried about every kid's attendance, but they were especially worried about students on IEPs and English language learners. And so what they did is they made a dashboard and then they put front and center on their dashboard. And this is the first dashboard that administrators log on to and see. They put front and center the attendance rates of English language learners and students on IEPs. So you can't forget about it, like it's front and center. First thing that principals log on to, I think is another good example of prioritizing equity. All right, so that's, those are just quick hit examples. I can name a thousand of them. Many of you are, are doing this uh, for prioritizing equity. The second, I think, characteristics is that organizations make data widely accessible and then they disaggregate that data. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the disaggregation of data for a minute. I, I am gonna just assume um, that most, most of you all are disaggregating data by race, by ethnicity, by, uh, by special population, um, by free and reduced lunch. Um, and and if, if you're not, I think you need to start doing that. But I am also interested in, in some other types of disaggregations of data that I've uh, seen recently emerge that are unique and creative. And I wanted to just talk about uh, a couple of those examples. And um, so one, this just actually came up, I think yesterday. And so I'm not gonna name the district because I haven't had a chance to, um, to, to run this by them and I don't wanna embarrass them, but they have a hypothesis. So they're uh, around absenteeism in middle schoolers. So they have looked at their middle school attendance rates and, um, and their attendance rates for middle schoolers are lower in their current climate. And they're trying to figure out why. And so their hypothesis is, is that middle schoolers, especially those, so middle schoolers who are chronically absent, especially those who may be navigating poverty, may be caring for younger siblings who are in elementary school. That's their hypothesis. I actually have no idea if it's true, um, but I think it's important to have a data system and a data platform um, and kind of a data inquiry process that allows you to answer that question and then actually look at the data behind that. And so that is uh, an example here. The WhoNote platform is, is a platform that would allow you to do something like that, assuming you, you had that data. Um, another example that I have seen um, concretely is I have seen a district, and this was actually Portland, they wanted to um, disaggregate uh, data and they wanted to uh, understand and disaggregate African immigrant populations versus African American populations. The reason they wanted to do that is because they had a culturally specific um, mentorship program that um, they had um, invested in. And it, for, in order to determine um, kind of which mentors to assign to whom, they wanted to get a better sense of, of those populations. And they felt like the needs were different and that the data would probably reflect that. All right. 
Number three, using relevant data. And this means holistic data sets. So the key here is that, like I said, kids aren't one dimensional. Data can't be one dimensional either. So um, it's really critical that you're looking at data um, across a wide set of domains. You're looking at student achievement data. You need to be looking at cell data, parent and family perception data, uh, learning, digital learning analytics, financial and ops data, human capital data. And then ideally what you really wanna be able to do is make connections across data domains. I think that's where, where the power is in, in the data inquiry process. Um, and that actually mirrors real life um, too. And so what I, what I would say is I'm gonna just talk a little bit about this. This, is a, this screenshot here is the, the Hanuit student profile page. And I could have used probably 60 or 70 districts as an example for this, for this one. But the, the student profile page is, is uh, who knew it's most navigated to page. It's, the, it's our, one of our most popular dashboard views. And I, and, and I think the reason that's the case is because it offers a holistic view of, of a student. So you can find out all the, all the things that you wanna know about a student. Um, you know, their, their GPA, you know, their, their race, um, et cetera. Are they on track for graduation? What's their, what's their absenteeism rates? Um, but you can also pull in other things like what interventions have been assigned to that student. Um, I've seen some districts actually pull in um, kind of what I would call assets that that student brings instead of just talking about a kid's deficits, like what strengths are we building from? And they kind of collect that information. Uh, that's something that you could put in a student profile. Um, but this, it's not surprising to me that this is our, our, one of our most popular dashboard views because it's really about providing that holistic view. And in this case, um, tied directly to a student. All right. So let's talk about relevant data. So relevant data, what could be more relevant right now than what I would call kind of digital learning uh, analytics and um, understanding um, which students are engaging in online learning and, and which students are not. So um, specifically, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I hope I'm not embarrassing Howard County, but I'm, I'm gonna call them out again. Um, they had a problem, like they had a, they had a, they, they wanted to know, let's put it this way. They want to know which students were, were uh, logging on um, and, into, uh, and which students were not and into their various learning management systems. And so uh, what they did is they looked at their single sign-on, that's the SSO part on this graph, um, into the Howard County Active Directory, and then they could see who was in fact logging on and then over what time period. Um, they made a whole host of, of dashboard views. This is one of many, um, but this particular graph, for example, this visualization shows by day in that week. Um, and I should point out this is fictitious data. We did scrub this a bit, but I think the point is still relevant in that, for example, you can see here like on Friday, there's like, it looks like it was about 50% of students didn't have a sign on that day. This, this would then lead a team of folks to say, well, why? Um, do we need to address, you know, adjust our instructional delivery model for Friday? Um, or maybe that was just the last day of school, I don't know. But like the, the point is, is it leads um, to, I think, healthy inquiry. And, um, and Howard County, as I said, has um, really been, I think, an absolute leader in this space. All right, number four is focus on efforts to increase usage and adoption uh, system-wide. And so uh, I actually think that we could spend an entire webinar just on this topic. Um, Dr. Courtney Stevens on the Who Knew It side is, is an absolute rock star in understanding um, usage and adoption and, and training. Um, but so I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but here's what I'm gonna tell you. Um, there's a lot of best practices here, but the first one is, and it's, it may seem really obvious, um, but it's you need to have an actual plan to increase usage and adoption. And I hate to say this, but a lot of districts don't. Um, and, and so if, if you're going to list like one takeaway here is just have a plan, um, and, and, uh, and actually reach out to, to who knew it, we would love to help you in, um, in, in creating that plan, um, for, to help you increase your usage and adoption. Um, but I do want to also call out the Bellevue school district. They're, they're in Washington state. I had an opportunity, I think I was maybe two months at, um, in my, on the job here at Who Knew It, and I had an opportunity to just be a fly on the wall 
I was just some like strange woman in the corner uh, to them. And I had an opportunity to, to watch them um, train. They did a big launch um, of their essentials uh, kind of data platform um, organization wide. And, um, and, they and they were training their stakeholders on the new system. And so here's, here's what I saw. First of all, I walk in the room and you could just immediately tell it was a big deal. They had free stuff, you know, like the Chotskys and all that kind of stuff. I know that sounds silly, but, but what that means to me is this is a district that's prioritized this. They're telling the people in the room, guess what? This is important. It's important enough that we're gonna give you like free stuff, right? And um, the second thing they, and, you know, they had an initiative name and then they had, um, they had uh, a whole week of sessions and each session um, was sort of tailored to a different stakeholder group. So for example, they would have a session tailored to, you know, kind of for counselors and then another session for their elementary school um, uh, administrators. And, and to be honest, about 80% of the content was pretty similar across groups, but it's that last 20% that they tweaked to be kind of more um, tailored to the needs of that specific, that specific group. Each, each session had learning objectives, just the way you would expect like any good instruction to, to, to happen. You'd have learning objectives, they had learning objectives. And then on top of that, everything was tied. Those learning objectives and the, the, the system use, the use of that, of the, the data was tied to their strategic priorities. Um, and then, it, it, and they also had just like a super fun and engaging presenter, which helped. And then at the end of every, every session, they had a, you know, what worked, what didn't, um, kind of debrief. And then they would take those lessons into the next session. I mean, honestly, it was just, it was a thing of beauty. Um, I just want to call out Bellevue. I hope I haven't embarrassed you. All right. And then my last kind of lesson here is acting on the data and monitoring progress along the way. So you, you need to have a data platform that facilitates um, the ability to, to kind of assign interventions um, or actions to groups of students. So like we already talked about Howard County um, example of students who are not logging on, they, they are able to then take that, that group of students um, and assign interventions um, accordingly. And so um, you, you definitely wanna have that. If you, if you go to the next slide, Andrea, I wanna show you a picture uh, that kind of tugs at my heartstrings every time I see it. I, I actually view this as, an iconic photo for the moment. Um, what, what you see here are two students, um, two children who happen to be students. They, uh, and this is in California, and they are sitting on the, uh, on, the, on the pavement there. And this is at a Taco Bell parking lot. And um, then you see two adults in, in the photo as well. And these two adults work at Taco Bell. And they've come outside and they've noticed that these, these children have been sitting there for hours on, on the hard pavement. And they ask the students, what are you doing? <laughs> and the students say, well, we're doing school. This is us doing school. Um, because you guys, and they say, well, why are you doing school here? And the, and, and the students say, well, because this, you guys have Wi-Fi. This is how we can get access. Um, to the internet. So I don't know what photo better encapsulates the digital divide more than this one for me. Um, and, and this by itself, this photo by the, by the way is data. It's not the kind of data who knew it produces, but it's an important piece of data. Um, and what I wanna point to on the next slide is it's important to, to act on data. And this is one last example. Um, this is Osseo. Um, uh, area schools, they're in Minneapolis. They're an example of a district who has acted on, um, on data. They understand like many of you, they're, uh, they were faced with this challenge of, we have students not engaging. Um, we have students not engaging in online learning. Um, and we also have, um, we know we have students who don't have access to the internet. And, um, and sort of similar to the, that Taco Bell photo with the children that I that I showed, shared with you, I think Osseo was fearing that maybe they too had a situation like that. Maybe you are as well as districts. And so they wanted to get data to figure out, to act on, on, um, on, on the digital divide issue. And so to make a long story short, 
um, they were able to use so some location analytics tools to better understand which students weren't engaging and where they're located. They worked with community partners, including housing. They looked at large apartment complexes to figure out maybe that's where we need to place strategically place some of our hotspots. Um, and, and they were able to make a great deal of progress um, in serving kids more equitably by looking at the data. They acted on the data. Um, and I think that I'll end here with, with this example. Um, I think what's important about the Osseo example is, is they recognized, you know what, there's actually a need to understand the digital divide, even if there wasn't a pandemic. This is actually something we should be, we should be tracking. Uh, we, should, we should understand. And so what, what they're in the works of doing, they may have already done this, but they're just making part of their, you know, the student registration process, the enrollment process, the students sign up and they have to answer a bunch of questions. They're just, they're, they're telling their families, they're asking their families, what are your internet needs? What, what are your technology needs? And they're recording that. And it goes right into the SIS, the student information system, which now means that, that you can report on that information. And then if you can report on that information, you can see that information. And if you can see that information, then you can do something, you can act on the data. And so um, huge call out to Osseo. And then, so I just I always believe in starting with what I want, what I want you to take away. I'm gonna end here. Again, I, here's what I think successful organizations do to create an equity focused data culture. They prioritize equity across the organization. They make data widely accessible and they disaggregate that data. They use relevant data and that means holistic data sets. Number four, they focus on, intentionally focus on increasing usage and adoption. And number five, they act on that data and they monitor their progress along the way. So um, that those are my high level summary and my thoughts around our, our, um, our customers. And with that, I think I'm gonna hand this, um, I'm gonna hand this over to you, Dr. Luck, to talk a little bit about what that looks like in practice. Cause what I just talked about was fairly, fairly high level. And I'm, I'm actually gonna rudely jump in. Um, so we have a couple of great things that have come up in chat. And so this felt like a good time to kind of take a pause as we kind of transition into this next section, which is truly just providing some additional examples um, of other areas of our platform and really getting specific around kind of metrics and um, end user outcomes and ways that we've seen our, our partners use the platform in different ways. So one thing I, I definitely want to address, um, there's a question came up in the chat just about the idea about teacher efficacy and ways that we've seen um, communities build teacher efficacy through data. So this is a, a strong area of passion for me and one that in my district we saw um, really strong impact around. So um, our, our district took the perspective um, similar to how we help grow any human, children included, specific feedback and um, chances to learn and grow with that feedback always is, a, is an important component of moving forward. And so really starting to think about data culture inside of systems and really working to build things um, in a community of trust so that teachers start being very willing to actually examine their data, both on their own and with leadership and in PLC teams, but to really uh, start to get a sense of their as is. Because we know based on uh, professional development, based on uh, natural characteristics based on a variety of um, personal components. Some teachers reach different pockets of kids much more effectively than others. Some are much stronger in different instructional strategies than others, right? And so as you start to be able to look at data, now you can start to surface those things that are working really well or those areas that teachers are uh, going to continue to need support. And if we cycle back to um, some of the things that Marcy touched on earlier, when you start to take a look at closing some of those gaps, when you start to take a look at really making a change in impact to student level data, truly understanding the needs and the strengths of your current teachers is a foundational component to understanding what kind of action steps are needed to move forward. And so um, our experience was teachers early were a little um, like, okay, is this a stick? You know, who, who's seeing my data? Uh, how's it going to be? Is it going to be used against me? Is, you know, do, do I really believe that people are really just trying to understand my strengths and needs so that they can better help me grow to impact students? And as they saw that be the truth of why my district bought, brought the data warehouse on board, the blossoming that we saw 
and the leadership that we saw from teachers truly stepping up to ask for what they needed um, from a position of strength to say, hey, I, we're looking at our data. Um, I'm partnering with this teacher. We're going to collaborate a little bit differently, but we've discovered we really want some additional learning in this area. And so it took it much more from a directive building leader. Hey, our data says we have to, uh, we're doing this next year because we're not any good at it to being a much more ground teacher centered growth mindset around wanting to better um, learn so that they can impact. And so I do think data is, is foundational to teacher efficacy. Um, similar to kids, if you don't know where you're at, you don't know what you need. Um, and so again, we've, we've had a lot of stories wanting, um, you know, where we've seen again, teachers really blossom um, to step into that sense of self and what they need from there. The other thing I just wanted to mention, because it's come up a couple of times um, before we kind of jump in to this next section, is there's been some questions around kind of logic models with equity um, and, um, you know, our, our specific things and metrics, uh, you know, related to that. So the one thing I really want to make sure that we, um, that we want to do is to talk about kind of the customizability of the platform. So at, at the Who Knew It um, kind of standard content, we provide a wide variety of metrics that we know are going to uh, be a great place to get you started. We talk about it being a starter kit for you. But we, we believe really strongly in building capacity at the district level um, so that you can learn the technology necessary to continue to customize and to grow and to change your platform as your data analytics change. Um, skills continue to develop and grow. And so we, we try to help districts become self-sufficient um, in terms of creating additional metrics as new ideas happen. Some of the um, components that, Shara, that Sarah shared earlier today were all created by customers. They weren't things that, that anybody paid who knew it to do for them. They were things that we built capacity inside of the school districts to do. And so we always wanna be able to available as thought partners. Um, I know it's been mentioned um, similar to, to uh, moments like this where we're pulling our whole community together and sharing best practices and things that we've seen be really successful. We also do those same things at a much more granular level at a state level and a smaller community set to really be able to share some of those cool ideas and learnings um, you know, that may be a little more grounded in where you're, where you're at regionally or the type of districts that you're working with. So I wanna make sure we hit on both of those. We are pretty focused today on really kind of looking at that student data, but I did, um, I did wanna make sure we address those two specific things. Is there, are there any other questions that have come up in chat, the Who Knew It team that we wanna, um, address here before we uh, continue jumping in. Okay. Whoop. You're muted, Trace. There, there's one I'd love to hit on real fast. It says, it seems that the data we use comes from trailing indicators. Can you suggest some leading indicators that can address equity? Awesome. Yeah, and I, I think there's a number of things that, that groups have done. I think, again, being a little bit proactive in terms of gathering some information that may not necessarily be relevant um, today, um, but looking at proactively gathering information about technology and some of those uh, Wi-Fi components. I also think um, as we get into the profile and take a look at some of the other pieces um, around that whole student view, there's a number of ways inside of our system to be able to see some of those bigger picture trend data lines. Um, so as we kind of jump into the platform, we definitely can highlight some of those things for you. But we definitely have the ability to see kind of a, a year by year comparison, not just end of year statistics, but kind of a week by week, where are we currently at, um, which my district used pretty heavily to help kind of identify, hey, for the last couple of years, we've seen a dip in attendance here in the next couple of weeks, or we've started to see, um, you know, spikes in discipline about this time of the school year. So really being able to not just look um, at the as is, you know, my current data sets, but also having those year over year comparison components really kind of put us in a mindset to be able to plan for what uh, traditionally is coming now. And if we're unhappy with what that looks like to put some things in place and to quickly be able to see if we are seeing uh, data move in that direction. Okay, so as we mentioned, there's a couple of other ways that we just have built into the platform um, that we wanted to show a little more granularly rather than bigger picture. 
Um, so the first one is, is kind of getting to know your groups. And I'm going to ask Marcy to jump in and share some of the examples that she specifically worked with districts around. Thanks, Courtney. Um, yeah, I think probably one of the most um, exciting days for me as kind of the data nerd that I've been was, was when Hunuit introduced the ability to do uh, GIS mapping. Um, it's such a powerful tool visually to show the geographic distribution of students um, and, and has been especially powerful. I think if you think about the slide that Sarah shared from um, Minneapolis, um, about where the Wi-Fi access was and wasn't and how districts then began to understand how they needed to move resources and able to provide better support for their kids. Um, I, you know, I, I think of uh, numbers of examples that I have from my experience over the years. Uh, one in particular stood out was um, we have um, in the Santa Clara County and the, the region in the Silicon Valley, um, we've had a number of families uh, from Russia immigrate into the county. Um, and these were English learners. And we, we live in a, a context that's primarily where our English learners are Spanish speaking as their primary language and they're learning English. Um, but there were, we were seeing pockets of uh, children coming from other countries and Russia in particular um, who needed support in learning English. And the GIS mapping really helped to identify the specific neighborhoods where families from different countries had settled uh, and provided some opportunities for the district to be able to target outreach programs that might more effectively engage these families and help them um, assimilate and, and become you know, more accustomed to the way education is uh, being delivered in the United States. Um, I, I think simple disaggregations um, by school, by grade level, by gender, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, I think when you touch back into the whole continuous improvement framework for schools, having um, a systematic process that takes the staff through looking at the story of their school and their students demographically over time is an incredibly powerful way to help everybody share the same picture, the same understanding of how who their kids are and how that may have changed over time. Um, I, I'm thinking of one high school in particular who developed um, a whole morning program for their staff to look through and do a systemic analysis using uh, Dr. Vicki Bernhardt's school profile process. Um, and at the end of that morning, the staff came back after lunch and said, you know, we just want to continue doing this. We don't want to stop and move to anything else. This has been the most important conversation that we've ever had as a staff. And it um, having that deep knowledge you know, not of just a particular issue, but of the whole context of their student uh, profile became a way for them to really develop some targeted action research. And so those things tucked real nicely into the Plan, Do, Study, Act framework. They had done deep analysis of the school population, had identified areas of concern, embedded that into their strategic plan and what the action steps might be to change outcomes for groups of kids. Um, and it was just uh, an incredibly exciting time to see the empowerment that teachers felt in having that ability to identify specific groups of kids and strategies that they wanted to employ. Um, and then we're able to see, did they work? Uh, so it was, it was an incredible, um, process to watch over several years of how a staff became very empowered and informed about um, how they could approach change efforts and make a huge difference um, in their uh, in the outcomes for their kids. I'm thinking of one other example, um, special ed um, in one district had uh, been gradually, you know, they've been identifying more students who had um, been determined uh, to be autistic. But until they started disaggregating their special ed data, 
by the kinds of special ed services kids were receiving, they had been unaware that there had been, you know, that their students with autism population had tripled over the last three to five years. And it meant that they had to really retool their professional development. And that was tied in with uh, not only with specific uh, special ed classes, but also this was a district that was very involved in full inclusion. Um, and so there were lots of resources and, and toolkits that needed to be developed to help teachers more effectively uh, support the needs of uh, this fully included classroom and, uh, and all of the different requirements uh, for styles of learning that kids were coming um, to them with. So, uh, you know, I think um, having the ability to do that thoughtful analysis to, to map things as appropriate um, just provides that additional level of impact that, that I think really can keep those improvement efforts and, and particularly around, um, around equity can keep those at the forefront of the conversation. Um, I, I wanted to then talk about, just to pivot a little bit to, um, and Andrea, if you could go to the next slide. Um, the educational opportunities, uh, I think, are things that uh, when we look at which students have access to rigorous and advanced courses, it's just an incredibly powerful way for um, high school districts or high schools to dig, uh, to dig in around the equity piece. We know from research that students who take an AP course are more likely to attend college. Students who, can, who take and pass an AP test with a three or better are more likely to complete college. So when we're looking at that long-term arc of how, um, how successful our K-12 systems are in handing off kids to higher ed or to more uh, to really looking at um, success later on in their lives, the ability to access advanced coursework is just a really great approach uh, when you're looking to harness the energy around um, making this kind of um, subject matter expertise for kids just to be a, a part of their normal high school experience. Um, I had the opportunity to work uh, more than a decade ago with Reed Saris, who was the founder of Equal Opportunity Schools. And, and that's an initiative that I think is pretty widespread across the country. Um, but it really grew out of Reed's desire to enable um, underrepresented kids to access these higher level honors and AP courses. And he, he called the work Finding the Missing Students. And um, we took that on in San Jose Unified. Um, I built out all of the metrics of things that were really important to helping them identify and then um, track how these kids were doing as they moved into, especially kids that had never been through that gateway into those more advanced classes. Um, and it was just electrifying. Um, we found that within a year's time, we were able to find the missing students to create a, a very equitable representation of every ethnic group um, in those AP courses. And that the fears that I think had initially been there that, um, you know, teachers were concerned that their AP pass rates were going to drop. Um, none of that came to pass. Their AP pass rates stayed the same. What they did do was, again, checking back into the process piece, they made sure that they had supports in place. They were monitoring kids throughout the year so that when they got to the AP test, um, they were well prepared for it. Um, and, and so it was just stories like that that I think really made uh, a huge impact. And, and teachers felt empowered, kids were empowered. Um, walking into any of the AP courses was such a, a wonderful, um, it, it was just exciting to me to be able to walk in and see the representation of students from all backgrounds um, actively participating in those courses. So um, I, I just think that um, 
when you start down that road, you also then start having to look at what the pipeline is that takes kids into those, into being prepared for those courses, uh, particularly around math. Um, and so you start looking in middle school, you start looking in elementary school. And, and so you, you begin to use a platform like Who Knew It to create views of the course taking patterns. Those are things that are often requested uh, for the Western Association of, of Schools and Colleges for the accreditation processes wherever you are in the country. Um, they want to know that you are encouraging kids to through the early on enrollment in courses that will impact their later um, ability to tackle the more rigorous and advanced courses in AP, they, they want to be able to see that you've got good efforts in place, that you're targeting kids that might not otherwise um, be accessing those courses, that, that you're making sure they're prepared to be successful uh, when, they, when they get there. So Tracy, I'll hand it off to you. Awesome, thanks Marcy. So I'm gonna shift gears just a tiny little bit and I wanna talk more about, um, you know, so can we slide, next slide? There we go. Okay, so oftentimes when we're talking about equity, we go right to the student data and, and we should do that. It's really important, but we also need to look at how our whole system affects equity and that includes staffing. And so, you know, a lot of times in districts and I worked at a district for, for 15 years, so I'm really speaking from my heart here. These are big organizations and they can feel really siloed. I mean, I could go weeks without seeing, you know, individuals in, in different departments and stuff. And, and, you know, we would really start to operationalize some of these non-educational departments like staffing. And so a position would open up and candidates would apply and we'd evaluate the candidates that did apply and we'd pick what we felt was the best fit and we'd move on and do it again over and over and over. And then we implemented some dashboards, a lot like what you see on the screen here. And what we realized is that by operationalizing these staffing practices is that um, our high needs Title I schools were getting all of our new teachers and then they'd get a little bit of experience and they'd move over to our other schools. And so, you know, what we realized is by, by stepping back and looking at staffing holistically is that we were actually creating unintentionally some inequity with our students and not making sure that these, you know, by we weren't putting equitable access to effective teachers in all, all of our buildings. We weren't even thinking about it. And so by stepping back and looking at the data, which isn't always readily available, we were able to see that we needed to change our staffing practices to make sure that we were staffing equitably across all of our buildings, making sure we put a mix of different teacher types and different teacher skills in all of our buildings and making sure that all of our students were served. Next slide. All right, I didn't plant Rod Road from San Diego Unified um, with his comment, but thank you, Ron, for bringing it up. <laughs> um, also finance, here's another place where sometimes we get siloed and budgeting in the spring is just super stressful and we have to fit the pieces together. And as soon as we're done, we're like, okay, thank God, you know, I'm gonna close my budget. But in reality, a lot of the equity lens, it starts here how are we dis, um, distributing our resources? And are we doing it in a way that really serves equity in our buildings? Um, and so, you know, it, it's really hard to see that picture in spreadsheets. I'm not sure that equity can really like jump out at us in a, you know, 2000 row spreadsheet. And so what we do to solve that is we start putting it in pictures. We start telling that story through metrics of how we're allocating our money to ensure that all of our students are served and that we're really thinking about that equity lens as we're moving money around and putting it in places that serves all of our students. So one other component we wanted to just uh, touch base with you on before we um, kind of wrapped up questions today and, and did some final uh, thinking with you is just <clears throat> uh, tucking back into the discipline conversation and with disproportionality around discipline practices in a system. And Tracy, I think is gonna actually go live. I uh, am. It's one thing to see a slide, it's something uh, totally better to actually get in and see how we feel inside of our data system. So 
This is one example um, of a metric that we have for um, really being able to quickly and easily identify some of those disparities between the number of students enrolled or the percentage of different uh, ethnic groups and gender groups, as well as some subgroups, which I don't know if we're going to get a chance to jump into today, um, but just to, again to give you a chance to see. So some metrics like this that make it very easy to see if the, if the line and the dot don't match, um, it means we have a discrepancy, right? And so um, being able to really quickly take a look at the percentages of enrollment versus the percentage of discipline incidents inside of a system to really quickly highlight um, either at a district level or at a school by school basis, if we do have some practices that may need to be examined a little bit more closely. I know in our district, as we brought this tool on, uh, we knew in our 32 school system that we had a lot of variability in how things were being approached. Um, and we brought the tool on with purpose, knowing it was going to start to highlight those differences between practices as well as outcome data um, to really look at um, kickstarting the conversation about coming together as a community and really aligning as a district system our belief in students and our belief about discipline and outcome data and what that meant. Um, and what it didn't mean. And so these were really foundational for us and our building leaders to truly start conversation about best practices, um, what their needs were around professional development, both for themselves and their building leaders, but also at the teacher level as well. And so these were incredibly impactful for us as a system to really look at closing gaps um, and really just starting to understand um, our practices across our system. So as Tracy, I'll show you as well, our system is built so that you can quickly identify groups of students so anytime you see a data element that's of interest, hey, I want to know um, what all these discipline incidents are, since I see such a large discrepancy, with a click, it's going to automatically get you down to that list of students that are part of that piece of data. So now I have a list of all of my students that are in this ethnicity group that have at least one discipline incident. It's a really big list because we're at a district level. I can click on any of the top of those uh, different data columns, like incidences, and I can quickly sort and identify um, and really kind of highlight my groups that might be larger um, than others with a simple click. And as we highlighted a little bit earlier, I mentioned our student profile. So directly from here, when I get down to this level of student, click on a student and jump into that student profile component, which again is kind of that one-stop shopping. This is everything we know digitally about the student in one location. So the overview is gonna give me a really easy, quickly graphed sense of kind of how long has the student been in the district? Have we attendance issues, discipline issues? I can see uh, we didn't have a whole lot going on and then all of a sudden we spiked this year with the student, right? So really easily in picture format starts to tell me the story about a kid. Um, rather than looking at trying to go on my SIS and switch and pull a different report and know which report number I'm supposed to pull in order to identify information, I can see enrollment history. I can see special program history. As we mentioned earlier, using our um, early warning tool, I can see lists of intervention. Um, speaking back to, and I, I blanked on it when the question was asked, we talked about leading indicators. We have our early warning and our predictive analytics systems as well. So being able to really look at what does success look like in your system and where are your current students on, on that path to success for graduating high school successfully on time. So you can see tons and tons of information here at the student profile level. Um, you'll notice there is um, also all of that detail across the top. So in addition to my overview, I could jump into um, detail in any of these different areas I wanted to, including discipline, so that I could quickly jump and see all of those different disciplines as well as outcome data. Right. So the ability to quickly go from big picture, I see an issue, all the way down to now I really want to understand who the kids are that make up this piece of data with one to two clicks. So I know we only have about 15 minutes left and while there's tons more we could um, happily show um, to highlight some of the capacity in the system, I wanna make sure uh, that we respect time for questions and that um, we're able to kind of do some effective wrap up. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass this back.
I let's, lost audio with you, Courtney. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> There's a big quiet spot there. Let's um let's go ahead and kick it back to Andrea. And we'll go ahead and wrap up. Awesome. Um, so if you have additional questions for um, any of the presenters today, please enter those into the Q&A function and we'll, we'll monitor those. We have had several um, specific questions, so we'll definitely follow back up um, with a recording of today's webinar as well as a Q&A document to um, address all of your awesome questions. Um, so a couple of follow-up um, um, items. I... Um, want to introduce, and we have most of our um, customer success team on, uh, on the call here today, um, we welcome a deeper dive into conversations. We know that um, the makeup of all of our organizations are very different, and sometimes this warrants um, kind of a one-to-one -one conversation. So um, Sarah and her team are definitely available to engage in deeper conversation around equity um, initiatives on how the platform can help surface data around that and, and just really explore some of these examples and what those might mean um, to your organization and your broader data strategy. Um, so definitely uh, look for the follow-up communication and we'd be happy to schedule those. For those of you that don't currently subscribe to the Who Knew It data platform, um, our education partnership team's also available um, to start that exploration with you. Also wanna give just a quick plug to um, some future events. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the fourth webinar in kind of our, our series discussion that we've had over the past couple of months. Our next event is actually gonna be um, around uh, an education leader panel um, that we're gonna do at the end of next month, October 28th, where we're going to hear from a few of our organizations within the Who Knew It community. Um, and share their experiences about their go forward plans of data use in, in this new reality. Um, and then additionally, we host several virtual user group sessions throughout the year that are a little more informal than today's session um, we, where we do open forum, really a place to share ideas and best practices. And we'd love to continue the equity discussion um, in that form as well. So look for future invites and, and kind of the next round of, of upcoming events in the coming weeks. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to share our recent insight report um, where we met with hundreds of educators across the country and really consolidated what we were hearing into kind of these four big trend areas um, that we're seeing kind of guide our work over the next 12 to, uh, to 18 months. Um, equity is a significant theme um, throughout this piece. And we encourage you to take a look at that and dive into more examples than we had time to, to share today. Um, so I'll just do a quick check. Um, there have been a few questions that have come in. Um, so April asked a question, um, and maybe we could, uh, maybe Sarah, you could take this one, um, just around support with action steps, um, sort of after the, the data has been analyzed, what does, how does that play out in, in training? Um, so I don't know, Sarah or Courtney, if you guys could speak to um, a little bit of the role that Who Knew It plays there. Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, the first thing I would say is we would want to uh, have a conversation with you to learn your current context. I think nothing is more important than understanding your current, current context before making um, recommendations. We'd also want to know your historical context. Um, and then uh, we can sit down and, and, and because each district, um, there are some, some, there's obviously similarities across many districts, but, um, but we would want to get those unique characteristics first. And so I'm not going to give you sort of a, uh, like a all encompassing answer, but what I would suggest is that you reach out um, to, to either myself and, and like I said, Dr. Courtney Stevens, is really adept in and helping you think through these issues. So that would be my, my recommendation. Awesome, thanks Sarah. If I, I could jump in there real fast too, you know, part of what I read in that question is, do we like to play softer and run away? And absolutely no, we don't. We become a community. We get on calls like this, we work with each other. Um, Dr. Courtney Stevens does an awesome job of coming out and working with your educators. And so getting the software installed is really just step one. And then these really rich conversations start to occur after that. And we, we do it together and we do it collectively as a community. 
Yeah, awesome, Tracy. I was going to point to a couple of resources, um, and we'll make sure to include um, link up some of these. Um, we have a great white paper around building data culture and kind of uh, data literacy across staff, both classroom um, building level. Um, and, uh, and again, it's not completely focused on equity, but I think it gives some really practical next steps for, you know, you're not just putting data in the hands of educators, right? What is the culture that we can help build around that? Um, and I think that's a huge theme and, and obviously very important in this equity work. All right. It doesn't look like we have any other specific questions. Again, some really common themes, so we'll make sure to follow up um, with more detail um, around what we talked about today. Thank you so much for your time. We hope you're leaving with some, um, some good takeaways to bring back to your organizations, um, thinking about your equity work in, in a deeper way and, and really improving the way that you're leveraging data in, in driving organizational change. So again, um, look for a follow-up communication. We have recorded today's webinar if you wanna rewatch or share with any of your colleagues, um, as well as that Q&A document and some additional resources. So we hope you have a great rest of your Wednesday and appreciate your time.